welcome again to the NPTEL course on storage systems. Last class you were looking at different types of storage and I was giving you some details about each type of storage and uh, we did not completely go through all types of storage because it is quite vast. So, I think we did up till highly parallel, highly available storage. Now, we will have a few more types of storage I want to just discuss so that to give an idea to get an idea about the various types. So, what is parallel storage? Access to storage in parallel in high performance computing applications. Usually, what happens in high performance computing is that you have a lot, lot of independent processors or cores, hardware threads, whatever you might call them. <coughs> and they are working on a large distributed file across many nodes. Typically, the information is a single file or a single device and so multiple parties are accessing at the same time, right. That means that you need to do some locking or similar issues, simultaneous access is going on, okay. And so, if you do not do this locking, or, or provide simultaneous access somehow fast, then the solution will not be scalable. Your high performance computing, whenever it has sequential parts, right, by Amdahl's law, it slows down, right. The only way you get 100 percent scaling up is by making sure that there is very little of sequentiality in your code, whatever it is. You have to systematically eliminate sequentiality, then only you can achieve the linear scale up, okay. So, if you are trying to access storage in parallel, if there is any locking on those kind of issues, they are usually the sequential part because finally, there is somebody, everybody has to go to some typically a central agent that guy decides whether to, whether to allow you or somebody else, right. Of course, there are some things called lock free solutions but those things require some more careful thinking, okay. But generally it turns out when you have simultaneous access, <coughs> you might get into scalability issues and also your metadata which is critical in a storage system that access to it or updating to it also becomes an important issue, okay. There could even be things like bottlenecks in file name processing. What do you mean by that? For example, I might have a file by the name slash a slash b slash c. When updating something in the lowest level, let us look at the suppose I have a hierarchy right. So, suppose I am updating this, that means something has changed here. Let us say that this is the directory which holds information about this object, something has changed. That means that this has to be updated, but let us say there is concurrent operation, that means that this has to be locked, okay. Because this is locked, you will find that somebody who is traversing it like this, he wants to add let us say something here. To add this, then something changes here. That means that this also has to be locked, right? So, in a sense, what happens is that somebody can hold on to some lock, and because this is held up, some other concurrent operation can keep this locked also. So, in a sense, what happens is this, there are situations where if this is very slow and there are other concurrent accesses which somehow lock this up and are waiting for this to finish, lock this up and waiting for this to finish. So, this guy will be slashed let us say. So, this guy is essentially you cannot do any, you can even get to the top or top part of the hierarchy and everybody is waiting for this guy to finish, okay. You can construct examples of this, that is one of the reasons why sometimes you might have seen when you are using your uh, system sometimes the system seems to be just stuck for arbitrary period of time 
and suddenly starts moving right you must have seen it it can be one second it can be 10 seconds right I am not saying it is because of exactly this some of it could be because of this okay basically because there is a slow operation and you need to update something there and there are other concurrent operations which need to update this for to update this the other its parent has to also to be held constant so that this guy's update can be reflected here. So, there is some kind of a way in which the locking proceeds and it is all stuck with this particular the slogan. Okay. So, so that is what I was talking about. So, basically if you look at palace storage they try to avoid these things. They try to ensure that you do not have to go through this kind of processing. They might use some direct means of naming. For example, I have a name slash a slash b slash c. I do not go through it directory by directory. I just hash it immediately look up that hash. Okay. You need to find some other different solutions for this. Okay. Okay. So, that is uh, so there are a lot of issues here, but I just wanted to tell you that there are different issues. Scalability becomes very critical. You have to really of course, it is true for many other situations, but in high performance computing you are the name of the game is scalability. You have so many cores and so much uh, multiple disks <coughs> should get corresponding throughput. If you are not getting it something is not right. So, scalability is an important issue. You can also have rip scale storage right. I think all of you are familiar with Google and uh, for search applications they have this Google file system we talked a bit about it and this is good for 64 megabyte kind of chunks but that is not good enough for smaller things. So, they have some other another additional storage called another layer of software called Bigtable which manages small pieces of storage and which is sitting on top of the Google file system. Of course, now all this stuff has been reworked in different uh, newer types of uh, storage systems, but this is the one that has been there for some time. And Gmail also has is a type of storage. You will notice that email is extremely uh, metadata rich right. Why? Because you want to be able to search based on whether who sent something to you, whom did you send it to, when did you send it to, does it have attachments ok. So, all these are metadata for the mail. So, often times you want to search based on metadata right. So, the thing is that means that mail is typically a highly metadata intensive. Metadata intensive means it is dealing with some small piece of information. We are not talking about gigabytes of data, we are talking about small piece of data when was it last modified. That means that you are picking up small piece of data and wanting to look at large large numbers of small piece of data, large numbers of small piece of data ok. So, this is metadata intensive. So, mail is typically one of those types. So, you need to design your system so that metadata is handled well. For example, a GFS is totally unsuited for it, absolutely unsuited for it, right? Even Bigtable may not be suited for it. Okay, you need to do something better. Okay, probably Bigtable will do it, but I'm just saying you have to think about it. Okay. Similarly, you have Facebook. It has its own compulsions. I don't use Facebook, but I'm told uh, many of you might be using it. So there is something called the wall. I'm told. Right, wherein you look up other people who have posted who are your friends or something and you want to display it. That means you have to go and go to lots of people, pick out small piece of data and combine them together and give it to you. Right? That means you should be able to access this data and also this could be geographically distributed because you might have friends in locally or internationally also, right? Multi cities, you have to pull out the data from distributed geographically distributed data okay. that is one thing that could be. So, that means that your system has to be really geared for this kind of access. Mm -hmm. I will just look at let us quickly look at this. So, the solution they have is what is called highly modular storage okay. very highly modular storage because it turns out this Facebook people require many different types of storage not one type. And not only many different types of storage, but also different types of CPUs which can be which are necessary for doing the kind of processing that is required. 
for example, if you take web and chat, right? These things because chatting, for example, you are typing a few bytes per second, it is nothing much. Even if you take one whole country is typing uh, chat, right? Let us say 1 million people are there in some small country, they can barely do 6 million characters per second or 10 million characters per second. Okay. So, this is not data intensive, ok. So, what is the reason why? But it is high CPU because you are trying to collect information from one place because it can be multiple parties can be attached to the same place, same chat room or whatever, right. So, you need to figure out where these things are and distribute to various places, ok. Typically, this has got high according to the analysis these people have done. This requires high CPU, low memory because I told you, you do not really type much, hmm? low capacities you do not need much, ok. You can do it with low capacities. So, what Facebook has got? They have a rack. A rack is a set of, uh, let us say, if you are familiar with a rack, how does a rack look like? Let us just, well, I think you all are familiar with it, but let me just. Uh, so, basically, this could be normally a rack is what is called 40 to you system. It has got various slots, it has some power connection to the back, and you can, there are some rails. And you can take servers or other specialized storage devices or network devices, you can insert into it. These are big things, usually 19 inch, this is 19 inch, and it is about each device itself. It is comes in terms of what is called 1U, 2U, 3U, or 4U. I do not I do not recollect what 1U means. Typically, these are about few inches. Okay. Let us assume that 1 inch is about uh, 5 or 6 inches and I am just guessing, I do not remember the exact number, ok. So, these are basically 19 inch wide things about 5 to 6 or 7 inches in height and they go all the way back to the end of the rack at the end of at the back side of it, ok. And there are connections at the back and basically what you do is, what Facebook has got is, they have specialized racks for each type of application. For web and chat, they will have one rack with certain types of CPUs, with certain types of storage, with certain types of network devices, okay. And they will replicate this on a massive scale. They might have at each data center some hundreds of these things, okay. And they usually, the good thing about this is that it has got integrated power management and uh, network management, all those kind of things. So that, uh, and failure management, for example. Okay, all these things are integrated here, ok. So, all the servers, all the network devices, all the storage devices, they all have a unified model of managing these things. Okay. So, so, they have some type of racks of this type. That means that they would have uh, uh, probably CPU and uh, memory together hmm, and then disks in separate racks, a separate uh, uh, four, a 2 u or 4 u kind of uh, uh, let us say capacity, they will have it as some of, some of the units in the rack. So, web and chat, you also need database because you are authenticating people, you need to keep certain information, critical information which you go through the database. Why do you need a database? Because this has to be consistent across multiple areas, ok. You could basically just the same reason why you need a database for storing money, ok. Basically, you want it to be give some guarantees with respect to accuracy and even if it uh, the critical thing about a uh, money kind of related matters is that whatever it is, you should not make a mistake about amount, whatever you do, right. So, you do not mind telling the people that I cannot give you the information right now, come back tomorrow, but I will not give you wrong information, right. That is critical. Similarly, in database also you do not want, so in this Facebook also when you want logging in people, logging out people, deleting accounts, doing whatever or privacy management, whatever you are doing, right. You want to give some guarantees. You have done it once, it should be that way, ok. So, database you can, it has got certain uh, more stricter semantics. It does not scale because of that. Right? It really cannot scale to the extent file systems or other things can uh, can do it. For example, Google file system is a file system, it is not database, ok. If you want to really scale to the web scale, 
database will not be useless, will be useful, not, will not be useful. Okay. So, but you need it for certain specific activities and the thing about uh, because of database being very intensive with respect to resources, okay, that is why you need high memory and you need high IOPS because they are going to be making lots of small accesses, you are updating your record, Facebook whatever information they are keeping about. It will not be too much, too many bytes, at the most it will be 4 kilobytes or 8 kilobytes, right. Where are you from? What is the last time you logged in? All this kind of stuff, okay. You barely will fill it in a 4 kilobyte thing, okay. So, since so many people are using it at the same time, right, you need to have high IOPS, okay. That means that what they will have is they will have a rack which has got a CP, which has got a CPU, let us say, devices they are not going to be that very high speed. Okay. Reason why you need high speed uh, CPU in the case of web is because you might be doing JavaScript, okay. you are executing some code. Okay. I think some of you if you have looked at uh, your Gmail, the very the first time you log into Gmail, it actually picking up a huge JavaScript code okay. and then it is going to execute it for you. Okay, that is why it becomes slow. I think some of you might have seen that it says uh, do you want a fast access or a slow access. Okay. If you want a, if the network is slow, you can go for the slow access that means it puts in a slightly lesser amount of JavaScript and lesser number of functionality. Okay. Reason why you need high CPU is because of that, a lot of in interpreted languages are being used and you want to execute them very fast so that you get reasonable access that is the high CPU. Okay. Whereas database you are not really possibly doing too much CPU activity you are not in interpreting typically those kind of javascript from that much. There will be some, there are some triggers of certain databases that also might require CPU activity, but according to their experience you do not need very high CPU capacity for this kind of access. They need high memory and high IOPS. Okay. I told you why you need high IOPS, why they need high memory, I am not very clear. It could be that uh, they want to keep uh, um, the metadata, most of the metadata in memory, okay. I am not very clear why that is the case. Mm -hmm. If you do the processing for example, okay, Hadoop, what is Hadoop kind of activity? It is about uh, trying to do some batch processing on the data that you have. For example, they want to figure out what are the trends, okay. is there some unusual activity going on in the system or they want to track your trends so that you can give you ads, okay, so whatever it is. Okay. So, this is basically you might call it usually offline activity that is this is not really real time, there is no user in front of it demanding quick or instantaneous response or quick response. These things are basically analytics you might call it, those things are done in the background to keep the system in good condition. Okay. So, here it turns out you are you are really looking at lots of data, right. For example, you might they might want to analyze your behavior or they may want to say that we know that lot more activity in, in India is about certain things compared to something else, we do not know what is what that is. That means, they are going to go through all your data, okay. So, that is why you need high capacity disk, okay. And uh, since you are actually streaming through lot of data, you are not really doing serious analysis, you are just adding things up and things of that kind not very serious CPU, that is why you need medium CPU, okay. And they find the, uh, I cannot really explain these things very well, why high memory for this and medium memory, but this is like their experience, okay. I am just reporting what they, what they say, okay. Similarly with uh, photos and video, you need high capacity, that is why they will have in the rack, as I told you there are many, many racks, each rack will have multiple units which actually have many of these high capacity disks like 12 of them in each one of those units, okay. And uh, again in the case of uh, this photos and video, it is mostly access and uh, access and retrieval, okay. Because whatever thing that is happening is happening on the client side, right. You are rendering the image, displaying the video that is happening on the client side, not on the Facebook side. That is all they have to do is to just give you the bits, okay. At the most network is stressed, but not 
CPU also. That's why they say low CPU. Okay. Now, if you take about other kinds of accesses, feed for example, you want to serve ads to you, you want to do some search, or you want to feed the wall, right? This is high CPU because you actually have to get multiple things and somehow put them together. You have to create a web page. You have to really take multiple information and give you a web, then present to your web page, okay? Which is what you, what you finally see, because your web browser has to be given a page which has to be displayed. So it has to construct on the fly a web page for you, right? Getting information from various sources. That's why it requires high CPU and search, because these are all very targeted search ads. All these things are very. You have to do some. Who knows? Ads might require some auctioning. I think some of you who study these things, right? You know that. They auction the spaces what has to be presented. Somebody is doing who knows some kind of ad auction also going on. That's why you need high CPU. For the same reason, you need high memory also. But you are not really doing as much data access as in these cases, okay? Because the number of friends you have is sort of limited. Hopefully, right? It's not some millions of them, right? So that's why you don't really need to look at too many of them. Okay. It's there is some usual typical bomb. That's again all this experience of Facebook people. So you have to really talk to them why they are saying what they are saying. But I'm just guessing. Okay, what why the why the way things are. So in addition to this, they have what is called a flash sled and storage sled. Okay, a sled is basically that unit I'm talking about. Okay, that five inch, six inch kind of thing. So so many of these things are populate this rack, right? So it turns out for high IOPS, right? They will have a flash sled which is composed of flash only. So, for example, your database, right? You need high IOPS. They will have 3.2 terabytes of flash, and that means this is composed with a lot of these flash flash sleds. Okay. For example, they need 3.2 terabytes, and they might need a certain amount of IOPS. So, in each data center, they might have multiples of these things because we are talking about 600 kilo IOPS. Probably they need about, I don't know, from at the most 10 million IOPS, I suppose. Okay, I don't know. I'm just guessing. But it could be in the region of 1 million IOPS. Okay, that's what they need. So they can attach about multiple flash drives, and that will probably take care of it. Okay. You also for uh, um, a storage sled, where you need, uh, you're not really looking for high IOPS. But you're looking for capacity, for example. Then you will go for storage. Sled. That's for, for example, these kind of things. Okay. So basically, they have uh, constructed a system of interoperable elements. Basically, I can mix and match. I'm looking for web. I need high CPU. I have a certain type of design which has high CPU processing power. And then I have a storage sled with this kind of stuff. I put in those things. So in one rack, I will populate this with ten of these guys or five of these guys and five of these guys or something like that. Kind. I need something which requires high IOPS. I take a medium CPU kind of uh, design, okay, if, and then I in the rack I'll put many of these flash sleds. Okay. So that's what I do. So basically, I by having separating out CPU, storage, and also memory, they can mix and match in the racks what you want. Okay, that's the kind of design they have. Okay, I just briefly talked about Facebook. There's a similar thing for Dropbox. In Dropbox, basically, that's a way to share information through the cloud. Okay. So these people also will have to service provide a lot of storage, and it's not clear how they, what they're doing, but they must be using possibly similar systems. There's also cloud storage. Companies like Amazon and Microsoft they sell storage services, and uh, They also have to give you certain amounts of storage. They just tell you that you wanted one terabyte or ten terabytes. They give it to you on the cloud, and they'll manage it for you. Okay? They give you an interface by which you can talk to it. It will not discuss it. Uh, normally, when we talk to storage on our laptops or PCs, there's a protocol. It's ID, what's called the ID protocol, ATA protocol, SATA protocol. Or SCSI protocol, or any of those kind of things. Here, they have not decided to support that because when you are at a distance, far away, through network, right? It turns out those kind of protocols will not work very well. 
So they provide some other type of protocol. We have to figure out that protocol. In Amazon, it's called S3, and I will briefly talk about it sometime later. Mm -hmm. And Microsoft also has something similar. The the user doesn't worry about how these are done. It is the responsibility of the cloud provider, the cloud storage provider, to ensure that the data that the storage that you promise the user right stays intact. They have to take care of things like replication so that whatever happens, the data is still there, right? So typically, they give you only guarantees with respect to reliability, access. They don't give any guarantees with respect to things like latency, etc. Okay? That's their only. So this is uh, becoming more and more important, and uh, you will see a lot of development in the future. So that finally, most likely, your laptops will be without storage. Most likely, I think you already see it happening. If you have used uh, an Apple's uh, Air or whatever, right? Most of the devices, storage devices, have been taken out. Only they assume that you have a network. Okay? CD-ROMs have been taken out, DVDs out, all the things are out. Okay. They might give you a small SSD storage, but it may not fit all the things that you want. And Apple himself, Apple itself provides you cloud storage. Okay, but that means that you need to have high-speed storage to network. Okay, so for people without high-speed storage, it's not a good solution. Okay, but it is the trend, so we'll start seeing quite a bit of that in the future. Okay, okay, so upscale storage. This let's look at secure storage. Okay, that's also this also is an important issue. Now, storage security is a very complex subject because I can do it at multiple levels. I can decide that the application should decide about the security, not anybody else, because then the application has complete control. Or it can be the file system can be interested to this, or the operating system can be interested to it. Or there are intermediate devices that come in the picture. We'll talk about it now. Already talked about it a bit, but I will again go through it. It can be through some other intermediary devices like the HBA or the network interface that can also protect these things, but usually only for data that is being transmitted. Or it can be for at the device level where it is actually data at rest. That means nothing is happening, you still want to protect it. So there are some things at the level of data in flight, that is as the data is moving from one place to another place, I want to protect its contents. There is some which is at rest. For example, I have a memory stick. I am not accessing it, I just keep it aside. I want to ensure that that particular piece of data stays there for the next 5 years without anybody else other than me be able to read it. Okay. That is data invest. I am not transmitting, I am just keeping the address. So anybody else also has got it, it tries to use it, you cannot use it, you should not be able to use it. Okay. So you can do it and typically it is in data in flight. There is also other kinds of solutions where you do it in the network itself and then you can do it in the storage controller and device. So I will go through this a bit just so that we, we are clear about what this is. So as I mentioned before, you have servers, you have the agents, okay. Before I write the agents, let us say that there is a, a file system also on it, the software, software on it. The software can be operating systems or file systems, those kind of things. It has got agents, let us call it HBAs, right. Host bus adapter. I think we talked about it a bit, right? And then they could be attached through some network, and then they can be attached through storage controllers, and finally, devices. Okay. So. So there is application here on top again, application, OS, FS, etc. Right? There are so many things out there. Hmm? So what does it mean to say that application handles it? Application says that I don't trust any of these guys. I don't trust the HPA, network, storage, etc. What does it say? It says 
I will do the key management. I will do the encryption and decryption myself. I will only ask you to store it. My interface is store these bits. I will take these bits. It's my business to encrypt or decrypt. It's my business to take care of key management. This is an example of I am responsible for what I for security because I don't trust anybody else. Of course, that means that he has to serve. He has to trust the server code. That's all. Okay, his own code and that of the system that it they are not coming in the way. Okay, that part of it. Okay, or it could be that the OS is told to do it. That means that, for example, it may be that the paging subsystem itself does the encryption and decryption. Okay, or you might leave it to the file system where it. When it tells the device driver, the HB at this side, okay, it says I will do the encryption and decryption and give it to you. You now store it. That's it. Okay. Now you can see different kinds of uh, issues with each of these things. I will go through each of them, but uh, just you have to keep. So what's the advantage of going with uh, the application thing? You are completely in control, but all the headache is also with you. With OS, that means that it's now across all applications. Okay, there is one person. The more typically, application is likely to make a mess of things because written by most of people like us. Okay, whereas OS is typically written by slightly more experienced people. Okay, so probably you might get it wrong. Who knows? OS probably can get it right most likely because more experienced people are there. But that means you need to get them to do it. You have to depend on them. It may be there are different versions of operating systems. You have to ensure that somehow they are doing the right thing across all these versions. So somebody says Windows 98 and somebody says Windows Vista. Who knows? Whatever that is there in Windows 98 is not there in Windows Vista. I have to go and beg the guy. Please ensure that your proprietary solution, whatever solution you have, works for me here also. So you are under the control of that guy. Okay. Same thing with file systems. The good thing about file system now is that it may be across. Multiple operating systems. For example, FAT file system, right? Now Linux supports it, Windows supports it, Apple supports it. So what I put encryption, decryption, whatever there in it. It's now neutral to which operating system it is. Or EXT2 file system, or if you take uh, ZFS, which is Sun Sun Microsystems developed it, but it's available in FreeBSD also. If somebody puts in uh, Encryption, decryption. There, it's available across multiple parties now, multiple operating systems. Okay. So that's the kind of stuff that are plus and minus things. Same thing about HBS. If you are doing it across HBS, now you don't have to worry about. You can mix and match all these things, devices. For example, there can be tape device here. There could be CD-ROM also here. CD, not ROM. CD R right R W right. Because I'm writing and reading it. Okay. Now this guy is across any of these things you can do it because there are some other intermediary guys who are taking care of how to handle the differences in the system, whether it's a tape or a disk device. Okay. So um, same thing about, for example, storage controllers. I made a mistake here. I shouldn't have put it like this. Typical storage controllers, they like to talk to homogeneous sets of devices. The storage controller will talk only to devices. What I find. Hmm. Okay, all the devices will be the same. It will be disks. There will be a storage controller for tape. Okay, there will be one tape one, tape two, etc. Okay, that means that if you do any of these things. Right from this side, you don't care what type of device is here. Okay, you can actually you can actually not don't have to worry about whether it's a tape here or whether it's a device. Let us start doing it a storage controller side somewhere here. Then what happens is that you have to are stuck with dealing only with that type of device. That means you have to make sure that Your um, solution, right, 
has to be treated both here and here. Okay. So, um, so you should think carefully about it. Different solutions will have different requirements with respect to who does the managing the security aspect okay. and how much of it is good with respect to the heterogeneity. I think we already discussed about applications OISFS right. Similarly, on this side also we will have the same situations. Okay. <coughs> so, yeah. Hmm? Now, we will just quickly look at one example a disk. Suppose I am saying that I am interested in this model, only the device, I want everything to be in the device. Okay. Why is it good? I have a disk, I put some sensitive information, I have great a new device, new machine, the information is still there in that old device. I might uh, not thinking twice, I might give it to my brother, sister, or some friend. That I might not really think too much because I might think that some file system is there that they will take care of it. But who knows? The party I gave it to has a slightly devious bent of mind. He wants to figure out what you have stored. He can look into it. The only solution is to completely put zeros or something. You should scratch the whole disk. But people have discovered that even if you write zeros. Unless you do it about some 32 times on using all kinds of interesting patterns on it, there is a residue of what was there in the past. Okay. So, with clever signal processing techniques, you can figure out what information is there. Okay. So, that means that I am interested in a solution, but somehow I do not have to go through serious administrative procedures. Also, the problem with newer disks, big disks nowadays, suppose you have a 4 terabyte disk and somebody wants to write zeros on it. You can just think about how long it will take, right. What is the speed at which you can write a disk? Assume it is something like 750 megabits, megabits per second. Or let us be generous, let us call it 1 gigabit per second. That means that to write 1 terabyte will take 1000 seconds at the highest speed possible. You know that uh, you cannot get really 1 gigabit because the disk has got different densities at different parts of the disk. So, you can go all the way from all the way about half the half or one third that kata, the speed. So, we are talking about even if I say 1 gigabit per second, we are talking about 1000 seconds and if you have 4 terabyte, you have 4000 seconds that is about 1 hour. And this is the highest possible speed, actually, it does not take 4 hours. It takes sorry, it doesn't take one hour. It takes close to about twenty hours or something. People are, who do it and practice, they find that it takes close to fifteen to seventeen hours. So, if you are a large organization and you want to decommission some disks and put a new one, somebody has to sit and do all these things systematically. Otherwise, you can't give it out to anybody else. Okay. There are some administrative overheads. Okay, so. Some people have figured out that you need you can do slide something different, and this is what is called on disk encryption. You do that disk in uh, decryption inside the disk itself. Seagate has some solution of this kind, there are some standards now. Okay. So, here the entire drive is encrypted. Okay. But what is interesting about this is that the MBR and OS unmodified, it is completely transparent, and MBR also cannot be corrupted because there is a shadow MBR that is kept. Okay. And authentication occurs before OS any malicious of loaded. We will just see how it happens. First, what is the situation? Let us assume you are a PC like architecture. Okay. Of course, there is a problem with this, you have to think about it because you are talking about BIOS here. That means that it is not useful for Apple kind of people, they use something else. Okay. That means depending on this BIOS, right, you have different situations here. Okay. So, the BIOS is reading you, let us say. 
you know how does the storage system work? What is the disk? Disk actually is a very, as I mentioned earlier, it is an intelligent device. You are asking it at a logical level. You are asking it, give me sector 0 or 1, depending on wherever the MBR is. Okay. That active entity on the disk, right? You can look at what you are asking for. Oh, it knows, oh, you are asking for MBR. I will not give you the actual MBR sitting there, I will fake it now. Okay. It you try reading it and because this act, disk is actually has a processing in, in it, right. As I mentioned once some, some time back, a disk has got as much processing power as a 500 megahertz processor or 1 gigahertz processor nowadays, okay. Hmm? So, it is an active entity. So, you give it something, it can look at it and decide, oh, this is, you are asking for MBR. Instead of giving you the MBR that we are expecting, it gives you some other piece of information basically pre-boot area you might call it and this is what is actually loaded onto the system and that is the thing which actually does the authentication. Just like your authentication for BIOS right, you have seen the password mechanism there, something similar happens now. Authenticate successful, drive loads, original, MDR. Non of course, this, this requires that BIOS or the boards that are there on the system cannot be the security of that system is assumed that part of it. If here in the you put in some fake uh, cards etc which can take control of this voice for example then your security is gone. Okay. So, there is something called a trusted computing model by which you can give guarantees with respect to what is there on the motherboard itself. So, you are sure that you if you are doing this authentication here you are actually talking to the legitimate bias. Okay. There is some issues here, but uh, as it, as I, all these things are slightly delicate. You have to really get it right, otherwise nothing works. There is always a way to break the system if you are careless. So, we looked at parallel storage, web scale storage, secure storage, there is also attribute based storage. Okay. This is one which has not really taken off it is a bit difficult to do just like real time systems. What is the issue about real time systems? You are guaranteeing that some operation has a certain clear bound on how long it takes, you guarantee how long it takes in some sense. It can take 7 seconds, but you have to guarantee exactly it takes 7 seconds or it can take 300 milliseconds, you want to say that it takes 300 milliseconds. You are giving very good guarantees about that it takes in 300 milliseconds or 7 seconds or whatever. Now, it turns out to be able to do such things, you need to do in the whole system can actually have impact on what you are doing, right. You have to analyze the whole system, ensure that the, bound, the 7 seconds or 300 milliseconds the bound is given, right. So, in storage also same story, as you have seen already that when you are accessing things, you can have the file system in the picture, the OS in the picture, the application in the picture, the HBA in the picture, network in the picture, controller storage control in the picture, and the disk in the picture, all these guys are involved. If you want to do anything with guarantee give latency or bandwidth, you have to control all these guys. Just like in a real time system also, if you want to guarantee the latency, you really have to take tight control about all these areas. That is why it is difficult to guarantee these things, that is why it is still not widely offered or rarely offered or not offered. <coughs> okay. Similar reliability, can I say that uh, this will last for 3 years? Okay. Or instead of that kind of reliability in terms of time, can I say that for example, I give you that the chance of losing data is 10 to the power of bit error rate for example, 10 to the power of minus 20, can I give it? I have this with 10 to the power of minus 15, but I do some other coding kind of things, I give you 10 to the power of minus 20 bit error rate, right. So, <coughs> those kind of reliability guarantees can I think that is becoming slightly more easier, this part of it is being people are starting to give. Okay. The other kind of reliability is availability. Okay. I mentioned reliability, this also availability. I go to Gmail, I expect it to be available. Gmail, because Gmail is using some storage, Gmail will not work if the storage is not available. So, if Gmail wants to give you some guarantees saying that 1 second in 1 year is all that I 
my system can be down. I cannot see my Gmail for at the most one second. Almost any other second in the year, I should be able to see it. Suppose I want to do that. So that I think the commercial world understands. So there is lot of effort at this point, and there are people who give you those kind of guarantees. Okay, you go to any vendor, they'll tell you my availability is ninety nine point nine nine nine. Okay, that means if you take one year as unit, only one by what is the ten to the power of minus three by ten square, I mean, ten to the power of minus five into one year. That's all the seconds. That's all the time I can be down. Okay. Similarly, in the case of power and longevity, power means what? Say that I can give I can give you guarantees that it will not take more than for your accesses. It will not burn more than this amount of power. Per second, okay. this amount of energy it uses per second. Okay. Longevity, I can guarantee that it's available ten years from now. Whatever data you have put will be available ten years from now. This becomes important for cloud storage guys. Okay, I'm putting something in the Dropbox. Ten years later, I want to access it. How does it provide? Or Gmail, for example, has been there for the at least ten years now, right? As far as I know, they still keep your email. Okay, from the very beginning. Okay, unless you have your exceeded your quota. Okay, so it is their headache. If they were to go in from Linux to some other system in the future, whatever they are doing, they have to take my data and give it a new form. Keep on putting the new data formats or whatever. Okay. So end-to-end guarantees are typically difficult. Okay, that's why it's in this stage. Okay. Now let's look at this same longevity we talked about. Let's look at this. Okay. So, one simple thing is, let's try to understand the problem. Saving current documents for the next millennium. Let us say I'm just artificially let's think about this problem. I want to store it. Some data I want to access it thousand years from now. Okay. Of course, we will not be here. We will not be there at the time. That's a different story. But let us say I want to do it. You done some amazing research. You want people in 2012 to still know about your research. Let's say, right? So, or your thesis, your original thesis, you want people accessing to it. Okay. So now our problem is that we write it in some particular format. It could be Open Office. It could be, but how do we know that Open Office will be there thousand years from now? Okay. You might think I'll put it on my memory stick, but uh, you notice that uh, five years ago I used to use a one twenty eight megabyte memory stick. I don't know where it is. Okay, it's sitting somewhere. I don't know where it is. Okay. So the fact that I return onto a disk doesn't mean it's accessible. Okay. But it could be on a particular file system. The file system also could have changed. Once upon a time, I used to use EXT2 or FAT16. Now this FAT32, etc., etc. Right? The file system can change. Okay. So basically, all these things can change. Drives, device driver, file system, kernel, application, everything can change. What is why is the application important? Because Your PostScript, Word, Star, Word, etc. All these kind of these applications, they are they have put information a particular way in the file. I need to know what that is. Okay. So in a sense, along with the document, there is some metadata that also have to be stored. That's the second question problem. You you wanted the data to be alive, thousand years from now. But if to make it sensible, you have to store the metadata also. But that's the same problem as storing the data itself. If I'm able to store the metadata. From the from I can also store the data. What's the big problem, right? It's the same problem. So I'm not solve the problem, right? So various methods have been attempted. Till today, there's no effective solution. There's no solution whatsoever. Some solutions are coming in the coming out in the future. We'll just quickly look at it. Okay. So I thought it might be interesting to look at older solutions. We'll see how it works. Okay. One solution is to emulation. Okay. Let's just take our storage system theory again. Suppose you have a USB. USB is you expect it to put it into some what is this called? Some uh, receptacle of some kind, right? You put it in it. It works. Electrical connection is made. But now suppose I have thin clients. What's a thin client? I just have a display. I have probably some multimedia kind of things here and there, so I can listen to music and so forth. But all the processing is happening on the server side. Now, I am expecting that when I put my memory stick, 
the server is able to see it. Right? If the server is not able to see it, that means I need to have another system on my side here again, on the client side again. It doesn't make any sense. So basically, I want if I put a stick here, magically through network, it should be accessible at the server side. It's able to mount it and be able to see the files what is there here. Right? So I want to convince USB devices, but I want it through thin clients also. What is interesting is USB devices, as far as I know, they have always been assumed to be electrically connected. Okay. But I want now USB remote functionality. How do I do it? I need to do some kind of emulation or some might call it virtualization of some kind. I want to virtualize a device so that I take this device and across the network it looks to the server right as if somebody had put this particular USB memory stick into its server memory stick slots. Somebody has to fake it, but it is happening through network. Okay, And this is the quite a common thing that has happened. I think you must have noticed that something called terminals were there on Unix once, once upon a time. They were electrically connected once upon a time and later people are accessing it to network, but they do not want to change the application called terminal. So, now we have something called pseudo terminals which fake a terminal, completely fake the terminal. So, that even though you are connected to the network from the point of view of let us say you know typing backspace all those things right. I do a backspace on this one it looks to the CPU server as if you are doing a backspace on a terminal which is attached to it electrically to that system there. It should give exact same semantics. Okay. Something similar also has happened in SCSI. SCSI was basically uh, was not across internet but now it is available on internet also. So, now there is some faking going on and you will see similar things happening in the case of uh, once upon a time floppies were useful. Now, suddenly some people have eliminated floppy drives right that is not available, but then I will want to have a USB floppy that is I have a USB slot, but I do not have a floppy drive attached to the system. So, I will get a gadget called USB floppy which has only a USB way to connect to the system, but I can put a floppy into it is uh, let us say uh, it a floppy slot. Okay. Now, what has to be done for that? Okay. This is an example of some st standard of some kind that occurred in the 98 and 99 2000 when floppies were still being used. You will see that what you have to do is your host PC is running application there is some specific piece of software that has to be added okay. and that actually essentially makes it this guy makes it look as though sorry it makes it look as though to the application the floppy is sitting there. So, that translation is happening here and sorry and then from this part this part actually he will actually use USB driver USB bus and then that is going through the network ok. It is going through the network of course and then it basically again you have to go through some additional piece of what is it software which actually does the complete faking in some sense. Okay. So, this only across the floppy etcetera, but if you are doing the network there will be network also here. Okay. I am not assuming network here in this we are directly assuming that we are touching it. Okay. So, there is uh, uh, this is quite common. Okay. So, this business of devices keep available. So, let me end with a slightly more usual thing you might not have come across. If you look at uh, Indescript right nobody has deciphered it. Okay till today nobody has done it. If you see the hieroglyphics the reason why they were deciphered was because they were able to find one which had three scripts side by side. The hieroglyphics something called Demotic Greek and something else they were all in the same uh, let us say um, same stone okay, Rosetta stone. Okay. So, therefore, they could figure out what is happening but nobody has done it for in the script. Okay. Nobody knows what it, what the symbols mean. There are some inspired guesses, but nobody knows. But one thing which uh, you find very interesting is you look at uh, in our country I think some of you all are familiar with some text called Vedas right. They say that it has been transmitted across anywhere from depending on whom you talk to it could be 5000 years ago or 3500 years ago hmm, without differing versions. 
people have studied various uh, Rigveda for example, across many places in India, some in the north, some in the south. I think as far as I know there has been only one or two minor changes that has been discovered. Okay. They are intact, exact things. Okay. What is more amazing is that these Vedas also are chanted, okay, Sama Veda for example, right? and they have some notions of pronunciation. Even these are supposed to be identical because there is no difference between various versions except some one or two minor ones people have discovered. Okay. Other than this, absolutely identical. Question is, how did they do it across so many years? Because we are talking about 5000 years now. Okay. So, here it turns out they are using multiple technologies here. Okay. One is redundancy, and that redundancy I was just talking about because we talked a bit about it. It turns out if you take this text, right, you have what is called a Samhita text, which is the some of you might know that Indian languages have the notion of Sandhi. Okay. Sandhi means you join th things together, right? For example, Rama plus Ishwara is Rameshwara. Okay, it's not Rama. You don't say Rama and Ishwara. You say Rameshwara. Okay. So Samhita text is basically the joint text. There is also what is called Padapata, which means it is each word in a separate form. Okay. Now already you have two types of text now. Okay. So there are separate bunches of people who recite Samhita text. There is another bunch of people who do Padapata. They recite it, and there are actually some ten types of people here. One is called Kramapata, Jatapata, and Ganapata. I just given you four or five, and they, these people, Krama and Jata and Gana, and those are few which are not mentioned. They actually do it in more interesting ways. Okay, in Samhita and uh, Pada, you know, it is basically you are basically what is called Pada Vicheda. Okay, you basically split the words. That's what you do when you go from Samhita to Pada. But in Krama, what happens is that they do some kind of redundancy also. So basically, it's something like what we disc, what we call red one mirroring. Okay. So, if something is A, B, C, D, suppose A is one word, B is another word, C is another word, D is, they will chant it as A, B, B, C, C, D, D. So, if you are right, if anything goes wrong, right, if one guy has uh, chants one way, somebody else chants some other way, they see some difference, they will say, let us talk to this Kramapata person and you will see which one of them is right because now there are two copies of it here. We can see, of course, it does not, it is possible that both the guys get corrupted, okay, that is possible. That is why they had other other solutions jata jata then gana okay this gana is very very complicated okay you have abc for example it will be encoded as a b b a a b c b a a b c etc okay so we'll just look at uh, one example of this this is the actual text okay padapata tam bhaga dheyena vi munchati pratishtityai okay that's just like that okay actually it's chanted for in ganapata like this Tam, see this 1, 2, 3 becomes 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3. Okay. So, you can see Tam is here, Bhagadhyayana, it is 2, 2, so Bhagadhyayana has to repeat it. Tam, Bhagadhyayana, Bhagadhyayana, again it becomes 1, 1, so it has to be Tam, okay. again 1 has come Tam, okay. again it will be 2 again, Bhagadhyayana, again 3, 3, so V is 3, V, V, right. Again you have to get 2 Bhagadhyayana, so you can, it will be chanted as Tham bhagadeyana bhagadeyana tham tham bhagadeyana vibhi bhagadeyana tham tham bhagadeyana vibhi something like that it goes. So this is what is called ganapata. Okay. So the thing is what they have done is they have given enough redundancy so that even if something happens they are able to recover parts of it. Okay. And this is done through human beings. So the what is called virtualization happening through human beings. Okay. I think I running out of time. So we will continue from here next time.